Hello, it's Tamsin Taylor from Colchester Gallery here and I want to talk to you some more about the beautiful city of Florence and its fantastic artworks. Today I want to share three of the paintings from the Uffizi Gallery, three of the earliest great masterpieces to be found there, two which would be considered late medieval and the third which is right at the very beginning of the Renaissance. To do this I'm going to read an article which I wrote some time back but which describes these paintings and, um, and I'll add some comments as I go along. Back in the mid 16th century there was a Renaissance man, an all-rounder, by the name of Giorgio Vasari and he wrote a book called The Lives of the Great Painters, Sculptors and Architects. The book is sufficiently famous for it now to be generally just referred to as Vasari's Lives in the same way as Shakespeare's plays are just called Shakespeare's plays. Vasari was indeed a Renaissance man being a competent painter a good architect and an excellent writer. Vasari's Lives is regarded as the first serious art history. But as the art historian John White, who wrote about Duccio, points out, Vasari has a good deal to answer for in the way in which he guided both 16th century artistic taste and also that of later generations. Vasari told us in most definite terms that almost all worthwhile painting began with Giotto and that Michelangelo was the benchmark. Moreover, Florence was the home of art and if art did exist anywhere else then it was hardly worth a mention. The art that went before the great painter Giotto, whose life spanned seven decades around about 1300, was what Vasari called the old Greek style, stiff, formalised, stylized, and unconcerned with realism. Vasari's biographies mention a number of individuals, notably Cimabue, who was Giotto's teacher, and the man who was regarded as Cimabue's rival, Duccio. Duccio was the leading painter of a nearby large city of Siena. Vasari had heard that Duccio was a very great painter, but since he couldn't find either of his reputed masterpieces, it was very hard for him to speak with authority on the subject. There were two reasons why Vasari failed to find these paintings, even though they were right under his nose all the time. One of the paintings was right there in Florence, hanging above the altar in the transept of the large Dominican church of Santa Maria Novella, about which I have spoken in a previous video. That church had still been under construction at the time when the painting was commissioned, and amazingly, the documents for the commission have lasted all these seven centuries. But the identity of the artist was lost on Vasari, and he presumed that the painting was the work of Cimabue, who had painted another very big altarpiece for the Church of Santa Trinita, of the Church of the Holy Trinity. The other major work by Duccio that Vasari failed to find was the Maesta in Siena Cathedral. And he actually went to Siena Cathedral looking for it, but he could not identify what he was looking for. And um, the reason for this was that these large altar pieces were regarded not so much as an object of worship, but as a view into a spiritual world. So they were very holy objects, and people prayed before them and made offerings before them. And still to this day in Siena Cathedral, along um, one wall of the transept below the organ, there are hanging hundreds of small votive objects, often in the form of little metal hearts, little pairs of shoes, rosary beads 
and all sorts of other objects that have been put there by people who have made their prayers in the cathedral and left an object behind. And in many cases, people gave quite precious gifts in honour of the Blessed Virgin and they were physically attached to these art pieces so that bit by bit a work of art as significant as Duccio's Maesta become covered with bling, with necklaces, with gold crowns on heads of all the saints, with jewelled rings and even layers of gold actually overlaid over both the background and the garments of the figures themselves. And what has happened in effect, I mean this is this has happened to many of the more venerated icons of the Orthodox Church. Gradually the altarpiece, the painting itself, disappears until only the face and hands are showing. The face and hands get an accumulation of candle smoke which builds up all the quicker because uh, the face and hands are only a small area surrounded by a gold mount and the candle wax gets trapped there. The faces go very dark indeed and this is part of the, um, the reason why so many of these works of art are regarded as being images of an African Madonna. Some of them are called the Black Madonna and when uh, later artists come along and copy an image, a lot of them are copied many times, so if they copy an image of the Madonna that is several hundred years old, they then copy it with the, the dark colouring that they can see, which is actually accumulated candle wax. And I don't know what the state of Duccio's Maestro was, but apparently it was covered with bling. And when Vasari looked at it, he didn't realise that he was looking at an extremely beautiful and magnificent painting. It's since, of course, been uncovered, it's put on display, no longer in the cathedral itself, but in the cathedral museum. And the other wonderful thing about it is that on the back there was a series of small panel paintings illustrating almost in uh, like a row of cartoons, like a, a comic strip virtually, illustrating the life of Christ in beautiful, vibrant colours. And people could walk around behind the altarpiece and see these. Oh, they're now displayed on the opposite wall, but they were once immediately behind it. And at some time, several of these were removed and several of the small panels have found their way into different galleries in the world, including a couple in the National Gallery in London. Anyway, this is the reason why Vasari looked at Duccio's painting and didn't recognise what he was seeing. Duccio's Rucellai Madonna and Gemma Bui's Trinità Madonna has survived the centuries remarkably well and are now in the same room as the Uffizi Gallery in Florence. The subject in both cases is the Madonna and Christ Child seated on a throne in majesty and adored by brightly robed and winged angels. In both cases the background is of gold leaf and the robes of the Madonna decorated with gold. The paintings have the style of the Byzantine icons which are a very important religious tradition and art form of Orthodox countries. However there is one major difference between these two paintings and the familiar Orthodox icons. Duccio's painting was four and a half metres, 15 feet high, the largest such painting to have survived, and Chimabui's painting is not very much smaller. According to John White, there are only about 600 paintings of around this date to have survived. Those works include the two huge old pieces by Duccio and two by Cimabue. Half a dozen small works by Duccio have survived, but only two or three by Cimabue, and most of them are now in museums. Cimabue's surviving works have suffered very badly. 
he painted a large crucifix for the Church of Santa Croce, about which I talked in a previous video. That huge, magnificent painting was almost destroyed in the floods in Florence in 1966. It is a, a, a sad wreck of the painting that it once was, a great part of the paint completely washed off the surface. There are two huge frescoes of the crucifixion and the deposition which Chimabui painted in the upper church of St Francis of Assisi. And uh, unfortunately what happened there was that during an invasion, I think by the French, the church was used as a stable. Straw was piled into the transepts and it caught fire and uh, the fire caused the white paint, which had a large amount of uh, silver nitrate in it, it, it caused the white paint to oxidise, so that the paintings now, uh, both of them, have the effect of being negatives, uh, like photographic negative, of the paintings that they were once. And you can only get, with your use of your imagination, you can get a an idea of how magnificent these paintings must have been as they are both very powerful, full of figures and very obviously because of the, the shape of the figures and the way the draperies are used and so on they are very obvious, late, late medieval in style they must have once been spectacular because they are two very large frescoes so, so unfortunate that we have so little to base our appreciation of uh, Chimabui on. Anyway, the one fresco painting by him that has survived is in the lower church of uh, Assisi and it's a, a beautiful painting of the Madonna and Child with an angel on one side and with a representation of St Francis of Assisi on the other. And it's thought that because of the age of Chimabui, he might have actually seen St Francis of Assisi before he died and that this is just possibly the only representation of St Francis by somebody who had actually seen him. Chimabui and Duccio represent the culmination of the Byzantine style in Tuscany and the heralding of a new era. While both of them, in the context of their great altarpieces, adhere to the forms that had developed through the preceding century and had their roots in the very long tradition of icon painting, both artists abandoned the formalised faces and expressions with which the Madonna and Christ child were traditionally depicted in favour of a greater naturalism. In the case of Duccio, his new style proved so popular in Siena that magnificent works by his more conservative contemporaries had their faces scraped off and overpainted in Duccio's softer style. As for Jimmy Bowie, there is a wonderful narrative told by Vasari about him. The story goes that he was walking one day in the hills north of Florence and he came across a merry little shepherd boy who was scratching a portrait of one of his sheep onto a rock. Jim and Bowie looked at this and realised that the child had extraordinary talent. So he asked the way to the child's home and begged his father to be allowed to take the boy as an apprentice. So little Giotta was the child and he soon broke from the old traditions inspired by a growing movement towards naturalism that was occurring in contemporary sculpture as well as in painting. Now, um, a little bit more about Giotto. What do we know about him? Well, in one of the many frescoes that he painted, there's a, a picture of a man with dwarfism that is often claimed to be Giotto himself. And uh, about 20 years ago, some archaeologists were digging around in the church of uh, Santa Reparata, which is under the cathedral. And they were looking around in the area where the tomb of Giotto, or the burial place of Giotto, was supposed to be. And indeed, they found the grave of a man 
who was about four feet tall. There was some debate as to whether it was in fact Giotto or not. So a pathology examination of his body found that he had a very high incidence of lead and certain other chemicals associated with paint and also that his front teeth were worn down in a very distinctive way um, as if he often held paintbrushes in his face. Uh, there's another story told about Giotto. He was allegedly a very plain man. And according to Vasari, once again, while he was painting the Scrivania Chapel in Padua, he had a visit from Dante. And Dante looked at the little children that were playing on the floor while their father worked. And he said to him, how can a man who paints such beautiful pictures possibly create such ugly children? And Giotto said, I make my children in the dark. That's just one of Vasari's little entertaining anecdotes. Some of these stories, we have no way of knowing whether they're true or not. Some of them have been applied to a number of people. Giotto's Ogni Santi Madonna, painted for the Church of All Saints, is now in the same room as that of his older companions demonstrating a break with this Byzantine tradition and the style that was to lead to the Renaissance emphasis on realism, solidity of form and naturalism of expression. Vasari greatly praised Giotto as being the harbinger of the Renaissance and after Giotto, the beauty of the so-called Greek style, as Vasari called it, was ignored and neglected for a period of about 600 years. The Trinità Madonna by Cimabue Of the three maestas that were displayed together in Uthetsi, Cimabue's is the most formal and in some ways the most arresting. The throne upon which the Virgin is seated is front on and rises in three elaborate tiers like a gilded wedding cake. Its decoration is chiefly its elaborately turned colonnettes. But whether they are pale wood or ancient ivory, like the 6th century throne preserved in Ravenna, it is impossible to say. Like the throne, the angels that surround it are perfectly symmetrical in position, in gesture and in colour. Only the four prophets beneath the throne have individual identities. The perspective of the throne smacks of Escher. It's impossible to tell whether the base of the throne curves inward or arches upward in order to make room for the prophets. What works perfectly well on the two-dimensional picture plane makes no three-dimensional sense whatsoever. On the throne, and set high into the picture so that her head rises into the gable of the frame, sits the Madonna in majesty. Her position, like the throne, is almost frontal, with just the level of one foot and the angle of her head balanced to left and right. With a direct gaze through eyes that have been strongly defined by the painter, she commands the viewer to adore her son. Her hand gestures towards him and simultaneously lies between her belly and her heart. The Christ child has little sense of babyhood about him. He is a tiny imperial ruler. His law is clasped in one hand while he gestures divine benediction with the other, fixing the viewer with his eternal gaze. Within this world of symbolism, the red of his dress prefigures his death and the pink of his robe, his resurrection. The quality of the painting is magnificence itself. The arrangement of the folded robes with their warm, subtle tones, the pattern of gilding on the uncompromising dark blue and the luminescent gradation of the vermilion and grey on the angel's wings, all combine to make this one of the most magnificent works of the medieval period. It is the painterly equivalent of the greatest stained glass maestra that in 
the Cathedral of Chartres. In Duccio's huge painting, he respects many of the formal Byzantine conventions. His throne is set at the angle that is usually found in icons rather than being straight on, as in Jim and Bowie's. It has more in common with icons and manuscript illuminations in some ways. The Madonna is conventionally positioned against a beautifully draped and decorated curtain, and the Christ child gestures his benediction not um, outward toward the viewer, but to an unseen penitent somewhere off to the side. Yet Degio's painting is in its own way revolutionary. The style of the painting of the face of the Madonna in the late 13th century was so formalised that every line followed a set and seemingly unchangeable pattern. There was a a U-shape inscribed between the eyebrows. The lines around and under the eyes were numbered and painted at set angles. Every single detail was dependent on some historic model from the past, meaning that over the centuries the repetition of these faces had become increasingly stylized, increasingly geometric and increasingly abstract in their appearance. To Duccio's contemporaries, the thing that set his paintings apart from those of his predecessors was the sweetness and naturalism of the faces of his Madonna and Christ child. Duccio carried this naturalism into the painting of the child's body. This child looks like a baby sitting on its mother's knee, with something of the feel of a real baby. And this was uncommon because Christ child was seen as having a foreknowledge and to demonstrate um, his wisdom even at infancy. He's often shown looking like a little adult, little old man, or perhaps a, a teenager, a tiny teenager. The naturalism of his Madonna and child extended to the angels, who, unlike Chimabui's angels, have real bodily form despite their ability to kneel upon air. They are differentiated partly by their position, which they are not exact mirror images of each other, but they are mostly differentiated by their robes, which fall in patterns that are similar but all different. And Duccio has used these softly flowing garments to demonstrate his skill as a colourist. The balance of pink and blue, both pale red apple green and olive green is one of the delights of this painting and it reminds one of the beautiful colours of the Tuscan landscape in the spring, of the delicate blue of the sky and the pink of the sunsets. Another delight is Duccio's use of gold. Now gold leaf was obligatory in an altarpiece. It reflected the candlelight and it looked wonderful in the church, and it was written into the contract and was often provided directly by the commissioning person. But Duccio has chosen his own method of using it. He has fully decorated the shawl that drapes the Christ child, as Cimabui decorated the robe of the Madonna in his maestra. But here, unlike Cimabui, Duccio has left the Madonna's robe deep and intense midnight blue. And now the blue itself was a very expensive pigment. And this very dark blue forms a powerful tonality against which all the brighter elements of the painting are thrown into relief. Duccio then accentuates the form of the robe and the body of the Virgin by the skilful placing of six little vermilion accents. Her dress, which is only visible at the neck, the sleeve and the hem, along with two little pieces of red cushion that precisely define the angle of her knee and her hip. This midnight blue robe is edged with gold. The line of this edging starts above the Christ child's raised hand and curves delicately upward 
to frame his mother's face. Then it angles downward from below his hand to the unseen top of her left knee, meanders playfully to describe the angle of her legs before falling in delicious loops and curls at her feet. It's absolutely beautiful use of line. There is a tributary to this single line that runs right around the entire figure. The tributary loops around the Virgin's arm and together they define the most important structural elements of the figure and its composition against the dark blue background of the robe. Giotto's Ogni Santi Madonna is something else. It's possible that Giotto went with Cimabue to Rome where he met a painter called Pietro Cavallini and some other artists of the Roman school whose works in general were more naturalistic than those of the painters of Tuscany. For whatever reason, Giotto abandoned formalised painting and began to paint directly from observation. He was a master of human form, a master of movement, and most of all, a master of human expression. He was the storyteller par excellence, in Florence, there are examples of his narrative at Santa Croce, a St. Francis cycle, which is unfortunately very sadly damaged. But in Padua, there is a magnificently decorated chapel. The entire chapel painted out, very large chapel, painted out by Giotto with the entire narrative of the life of Christ. And it is here that we see just what an effective storyteller he was, particularly in the more tragic um, aspects of the life of Christ. One of the most visually stunning in terms of composition and most emotional scenes uh, is the one where Judas Iscariot betrays Jesus by kissing him and Jesus is seized by the soldiers and taken off for trial. This is an amazing painting. The positioning of the colour of the yellow robe, the way in which the figures are partly screened by intruding figures and, and the, uh, this robe, is it, an amazing piece of composition. The other very um, emotionally charged picture of that series is uh, probably the most famous painting in the chapel is the lamentation over the body of Jesus where the body of Jesus is laid out with his mother and disciples mourning over him and in the heavens the angels are going wild with grief and this painting appears to lead on an emotional level, on an expressive and symbolic level, into Leonardo's Last Supper, painted so many years later, but where Leonardo has picked up on the expression of emotion by 12 individuals and made every one of them different, just as Giotto has succeeded in doing in his lamentation over the body of Christ. Or you've got one with his arms thrown out, and one person with their hands clasped together, people there, every possible expression of grief that you could fit into these figures is there. It's absolutely superb. But back to Giotto's Oni Santi Madonna. This painting, of course, is a very formal painting, did not lend itself to this type of narrative. Much of his ability in telling a story is not apparent in this particular work, which is a conventional altarpiece uh, would have been commissioned with very rigid stipulations but within these constraints Giotto has succeeded in creating a highly original work. As with the other great masters the painting is dominated by the figure of the Virgin Mary conventionally seated on a throne surrounded by angels and as with the other paintings and as was usual in a Maestro painting, her importance is indicated by her scale being much larger than the other figures in the painting. The throne here, for the first time, is real. It is architecturally Gothic in style. It's three-dimensional and it's constructed of marble 
and the marble is set with decorative polychrome inlays of a type that are still produced in the city of Florence and can be bought as, uh, as tourist items. The Madonna herself and the figures who stand around are as three-dimensional and tangible as the marble throne is, despite the discrepancies in their size. The Christ child is chubby and babyish. The faces of the Madonna and child appear to respect the trend begun by Duccio, but they have not quite broken away entirely from the expected formality, but they don't have any of the mandatory linear features that you would get in a truly medieval painting. They're taking on the characteristics of a real mother and son. And this is one of the points that was made by the critic John Ruskin, the 19th century critic, when he saw Giotto's work. He said that whatever Giotto painted, it was mama, papa and baby, that he saw the, the people of the biblical narrative in very human terms, and that is the way he painted them, and that is the way he has painted the mother and child here. It is the bodily form and the posture of the Virgin, more than anything else, that are a radical departure from the past. This is the figure of a real woman, whose large, solid body is seated on a cushion on the throne, with her feet firmly planted, her knees apart, and her body is tilted slightly forward and at a slight angle in order to balance the weight of the child that she's holding. Unlike Duccio and Chimabui, who have relied on gold to create the flow of the cloth over and around the body, Giotto has succeeded in introducing tonality into this huge, unmanageable chunk of very dark blue paint. So he's defined the form of the jutting knees and the heavy drapes as if daylight was falling across them. And that in itself is really very revolutionary. There are gold borders, but they've been minimised and they have been perfectly placed to visually accentuate the weight and balance of the figures. The tiny touches of vermilion, which were also used by Duccio, surround and emphasise the child in his little pink dress, and the angels and saints stand or kneel around like real people. Their halos are like dinner plates, and they overlap in places they get in the way of partly obscure other people's faces, causing the same sort of problems that large hats have at a wedding. Another feature of the painting is Giotto's use of white. I haven't commented on white in either of the other two paintings. Usually garments in these pictures up to that point in time, they were brightly coloured, but he has chosen to robe two angels at the very front of the picture in simple white garments in contrast to the midnight blue of Virgin's robe and the dark green of the other angels. The white garments of the angels reflect the colour and tonality of the dress of the Virgin, uh, possibly symbolising her purity, but the use of white for the robe of the Virgin is very unusual because her dress was usually painted red. The effect of the positioning of these two angels in white near the Virgin in her white dress is stunning because it forms a large triangle of which the face of the Virgin is at the apex. This triangular format, consciously demonstrated here, was to then become the basis of subsequent Florentine altarpieces once the formalities of the medieval style had been completely abandoned. So you see this triangular composition occurring over and over again in Renaissance art, particularly large paintings, vertical paintings, such as altarpieces. If you are an art lover and you go to the Uffizi, I thoroughly recommend that you spend time with these works before going on to look at the work by the later and better known artists such as Botticelli and Leonardo da Vinci. These paintings are really worth any time that you like to spend with them. They are superb. 
Giotto will be pointed out as one of the more famous painters represented in the gallery, but Cimabue and Duccio are often a little bit ignored. And uh, one of the questions that I like to ask is um, which one of these three enormous altarpieces of the same subject, Maestra, which one of them do you like best and why? What is it? Well, Giotto's achievement is absolutely astounding. You know, you've got to love it. it. It is a superb painting and it was so important. It was groundbreaking. It was so important to what came after it. You look at Giotto and you know that he influenced Piero della Francesca, that he influenced Masaccio and so many other different painters who got excited about his work. But what of Duccio with his wonderful gold edge, his sweet Madonna, his adorable baby and the angels in their exquisite spring-like garments. I love it. Chimabui, the word that I would use to describe it is awesome. I once heard that word used to describe the playing of the organ in Westminster Abbey after a service. Awesome. Totally awesome. And um, I can't help associating with the Chimabui painting, um, the hymn, Let All Mortal Flesh Keep Silent. There, there is this lovely line that says, Row on row the hosts of heaven, cherubim with sleepless eye, worshipping Christ in Chimabui's painting. It really, really does create an awesome sort of an image. And the face of the Virgin looks very wise and and very prophetic. So for me, I think the Chimabui just has a slight edge. Go to the Uffizi in Florence, and before you go to look at the Botticelli, look at the Three Maestra and choose yourself 